Good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to, to introduce my colleague Dr. Chris Williams uh, this evening. Uh, Dr. Williams is the lead consultant epidemiologist at the uh, Communicable Disease Surveillance Centre within Public Health Wales. He also works with the European Programme for Intervention Epidemiology Training and the UK Field Epidemi Epidemiology Training Programme currently as supervisor and previously as a scientific coordinator. <clears throat> Chris is a natural sciences uh, graduate of Cambridge University and a medicine graduate of London University. After medical training and hospital posts in internal medicine and infectious diseases, Chris completed specialist training in public health in the east of England. This was followed by a two-year fellowship at the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin, and five years as a consultant in communicable disease control, again in the east of England. <clears throat> He's also worked for the World Health Organization on short missions to Turkey, Egypt, and Guinea. His professional interests include surveillance, gastrointestinal and zoonotic infections, and field epidemiology. Outside of work, Chris enjoys dinghy sailing, baking, and playing on the guitar, uh, but not uh, simultaneously. Uh, Chris, it's uh, great to have you uh, with us this evening. So very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, James, and, and thanks everyone for, for coming along. Um, I'm just gonna try and share my screen and hope that this kind of works. So bear with me a second. Um, so I'm just gonna share that. If I do this, then hopefully it will work. Right, is that something that looks like a presentation? Perfect, yeah. Okay, lovely. And um, so, and apologies, I'm a little bit flustered. I've actually come from one of my hobbies here, not sailing, but uh, my guitar lesson. So I was trying to, to do something with three flats that's uh, very difficult. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, hopefully it's given me a little bit of a break between my, my working day and this. So um, thank you for the introduction. Um, so what I, I wanted to talk about is, is a bit of a reflection on the pandemic and kind of how we got here, as it were. Um, and where is here? So I just put in, this is one of my own photos. So this is when I walked into work uh, during the lockdown. And uh, this is sort of what it looked like in Cate's Park when normally there there's a few more people park. This is, does not look like when there's the rugby on. Um, and this has really never happened before in the, unless you came at sort of five in the morning or something on a summer's day. So this is not normal. So how did we get to this um, based on where we are? And, and how did I end up um, as an epidemiologist getting involved in all of this? So I'm going to try and explain how infections are transmitted and how we kind of model them and why we got to these decisions. A bit about past infections and about a little bit about how the decision was made at the time. I was only involved a little bit on the edges of some of the committees, but um, a lot of this is in the public domain now. So, so I think it's worth reflecting briefly on that. Also, whether, whether it worked, um, and I think to give you a spoiler, I think it did work, um, but the, the repercussions are going to be longer than we know about. Uh, and also what's next, because I'm, I'm doing a lot of planning at the moment for what we do now. And just the usual, particularly for my department, we always give our caveats, apologies, our data's not very good, etc. So we're still in the pandemic. Um, things have changed a lot, but, but we're not out of the woods yet. And I've not con fin finished reflecting, nor have other people. Um, and the conclusions may well be wrong. I've also experienced any small part of this pandemic. Um, the more you look at it, the more you realize what I, what I don't know. So, so don't expect, um, you know, completeness. And also my apologies is, is people have languages of love, etc. but my language of communication appears to be in charts and graphs. So um, if you don't like those, then maybe, um, you know, another night's entertainment would be better. So, Looking at the model of infection, so how do how do people get infected and, and, and how does it translate into your groups and the population? Now, we don't really care about 
the other aspects of your life in this in this sense we only care if you if you're susceptible if you've become infected and having become infected whether you're infectious and then whether you're recovered now there's some little bit of um nuances here so you can be recovered and then you can go back to being susceptible of which more later um you can be infectious before you feel that you're infected you can be infectious after you're recovered um and as i say there's this concept of waning immunity so you might uh, you might become susceptible again one principle that's helpful also is that it's quite hard to catch an infection while you've already got that infection so however much immunity wanes it's um you know once if you get an acute infection of something you're unlikely to get another acute infection while you're still ill with the first one so that's that's at least some limit to um to your infectiousness but after you've recovered and you've got rid of the pathogen then uh, sometimes it's fair game for the next one to come along so I'm going to try and talk about the infamous basic reproductive number or R. So the idea is for person to person diseases, um, each case generates some more cases. So the first factor of this is what's the probability of contacting with um, between a, a, a susceptible person, the green people and the infected person. And clearly the more people you've got infected, the more prob the higher the probability of one of those bumping into a susceptible person that's the circle on the right um so and if you're adding if you're working out what the next generation of infection is going to look like then you start off with how many infections you've got at the moment it's a bit like compound interest basically if any of you are financial whizzes so that you know the amount that your money is worth is is it depends on how much you start off with uh, multiplied by whatever the the increase or hopefully increase and not decreases there's a second bit to it so um you can imagine that for some diseases or some circumstances um you have more contacts in a given unit time and there has to be unit time here because because of course you, over your lifetime you have more contacts than you have in say one day so we usually use a unit of time like a day or something like that so imagine for for the the point on the left, um, this person's contacting four people per day, whereas in the circumstance on the right, they're only contacting one person per day. If um, if as time goes on, if you add up all those, imagine these four on one day, and then the next day you contact one person, and then maybe the next day you contact another four, that's adding to the numbers of people that you contact. And that only happens while you're infectious. So. The total number of um, secondary infections is going to be the number of uh, contacts you have on average per day multiplied by the number of days which you're infectious, you're shedding stuff. So if you imagine you're sneezing, you're sneezing for five days, during those five days you come into contact with five people per day, then that's you know 25 people that you've potentially um, passed on infection to. However, um, some contacts are more contacty than others. So um, you might be, uh, as in the Rodan sculptor here on the right, you might be in very close contact uh, and really quite likely to, to pass something on. Um, on the other hand, uh, these two individuals here, who I photographed uh, when I was in Guinea um, in an isolation room, fortunately without Ebola, but uh, they had to take precautions. Um, these people are unlikely to catch whatever it was that I had because they are well gowned up. Um, these are nurses from the French army um, and, and they don't feel at all worried and there's not the same degree of contact as, as with the two on, on the right. So clearly there's a between 0 and 100 percent there's a probability of infection given contact. So basically you, you put them all together um in a formula and you multiply them up so it's the number of contacts per unit time times the length of time you're infectious and spreading multiply the by, by the probability of transmission so you can see that each of those if you're trying to control the disease is amenable to change so if everybody stops contacting other people and doesn't have contact with anybody then that first one goes down to one or below one if at the, 
very day. Imagine if the very point at which you became infectious, you knew. So a little thing pinged up on your phone or your, or your glasses and said, you're infectious, go away and hide. If you absolutely knew when you were infectious, your duration of infectiousness could go down to effectively zero and that would that would also go down. I mean, that's a practical thing rather than a, um, you know, it's not going to happen in, in practice, but it's a theoretical concept. And then the last one is, if you were dressed up like those uh, those French army nurses, and um, then your probability of transmission um, to other people, or their probability of transmission, you know, to you would be much lower. So these are three things that you can do stuff about to um, change uh, the dynamics of infection. There's a final limit to the reproduction number, which is where vaccines and immunity comes in, which is some people can't get infected. So some people like these happy green with a thick line around them, they are uh, immune to the infection. So out of all the people that you might have got infected, say that you were about to infect 10 people, but only half of them are susceptible and the other half are immune, then the limit goes down to, to only half. So, so say you, you, you had, say there was eight people in this case, only actually four of them can be transmitted to. So you've halved the reproductive number and you've halved the transmission. Okay, so this is a lot of math at the beginning, straightforward, and you think, well, all I have to do is get uh, the infection levels I like. But unfortunately, it is a little bit like, um, a little bit like a inflation, etc. So it can't get its exponential growth upwards. Um, it just happens like that. Eventually, um, what happens is when you get to the point at which um, the uh, you get to the peak, it turns around because um, R has gone below one here. So you see in the middle of this chart, um, the um, reproductive number comes down to one because people are immune and that immediately tips it back down. So that's the, what makes the seesaw go down. You get the same whether R is three or R is 10 it's just that one's a bit sharper and you probably noticed um, that for some of our previous waves looked like the first one and a recent wave looks more like the second one and that's just purely a mathematical property that something that's that's a highly reproductive number is going to get to its peak quicker than something that's got a, a smaller reproductive number but unfortunately all of them have exponential growth upwards as long as that one case is, is giving rise to more than one other case um and uh yeah in the same way that things compound in the real world over the long term imagine if everyone was immune um following infection um that would be it and everyone no one would ever get it again but in reality uh, this is this is a very very simple this is not the complicated modeling that you might see from uh, colleagues in say um what you can see is that rising red line every year of susceptible people and when you get to enough susceptible people the disease says all right okay i can have it those and there goes another spike and the reason you might get that rise in susceptible people is either for example um birth so in this example this is just new people being born when you're born you haven't seen the disease before and uh, you're not immune so you get to a pool of people and then the infection reaches a peak um, but it could equally come from people who've recovered, whose immunity then starts to get worse. So then you also get a pool of people who are susceptible that rises. So this is what happens with um, infections that are spread from person to person, um, often respiratory infections like this one. The behaviour is quite characteristic. And what you notice is there's, there's not much that you can do about it. It tends to come along, whips up, comes down that's it there's, there's there's not a huge amount of um possibility for control here um now we have managed to control we've had numbers of past pandemics and i'm excluding some foodborne illnesses where you just poison a load of people at once 
So we've had uh, SARS-1 in 2003, we've had swine flu in 2009, um, the Ebola outbreak in 2014-15, um, which you know had a slightly slower um, rise and fall and didn't make it to, to full pandemic status. Um, and we've had smaller ones like the MERS-CoV, which is still um, knocking around, uh, monkeypox, we've had outbreaks of. And every year we get other seasonal viruses and infections like influenza and seasonal coronavirus. Uh, that cause a big wave. So one example I want to give you of where we try to console and have managed to console something in the past is measles in South Wales. Some of you may remember the Swansea outbreak which was happening just before around the time I came and took this job in Wales. So with measles you've got a great vaccine that is 95% uh, percent protective and also gives you long-term immunity. Uh, which is brilliant, um, but unfortunately it raised unrealistic expectations for the current pandemic. Um, the reproductive number is 13, so even higher than, than Omicron really. And the vaccine doesn't, doesn't just prevent disease, but it also prevents you becoming infectious, which is also uh, sadly a lot better than the, the current uh, coronavirus vaccines. So what happened in 2013, there was a big outbreak, um, several thousand cases in, in Swansea, including one death, sadly. And why might this have happened? Well, from the foregoing um, explanations, going back to that graph again, it was caused by a steady increase in the number of susceptible people. It's like Tinder, you know, leaving a pile of Tinder there and eventually it's big enough and someone throws a match and it all catches light. So um, that Tinder pile was, was sort of started by the, the Wakefield vaccine um, scare in 2001 that led to a lot of adverse um, coverage in the press. And there was a whole cohort of children who basically should, didn't get vaccinated as much as they should have done. And that started in 2001 or so. And those children that carried on with slightly suboptimal immunisation for a number of years, that pool of susceptibles grew up the, the, the pile of tinder until in 2013 there was enough to get a good going outbreak. Uh, and as my colleagues found when they, they studied this, that actually the cases in the outbreak were more likely to have led specific newspapers um, like the, the Welsh Mill or the Western Mail uh, and this influenced their, their views about immunisation. So this was an example where actually the answer to this outbreak was purely immunisation and what happened is we asked people to come and be immunised and they came forward and and that filled that immunity gap and it brought the infection under control and there was no lockdown necessarily for Swansea. This is another example of um, actually normally we have lots of these outbreaks but we don't normally try and measure the reproductive number but this was a, a scout jamboree um, again in the 2000s in the Netherlands and um, they started to get norovirus, this awful vomiting illness which some of you may have had and in order to console it so they, they didn't lock everyone down to their tents what they tried to do was reduce the probability of transmission from one person to other by um, hand washing and by isolation of cases which reduces the number of contacts each case has. So there were a couple of measures, there were a few others that they brought in to try and reduce those different aspects of transmission. And this was modelled after the, uh, after the um, Jamboree and what they found out was, was that actually they nearly did it. So they nearly with those measures got R below one, but unfortunately because it wasn't quite below one, it was just above one the outbreak continued um, with that increase of cases following the, the measures and it was only sending all the uh, the children home back to their own home countries that actually ended the, the outbreak but uh, probably caused quite a few little outbreaks in their own houses and schools back in their, their countries. So, but this is not something we normally model in this way. We've also had warnings, oh dear that slide's gone a bit long, uh, we've also had warnings from other infections. So we had SARS-CoV-1 um, where there was rapid international spread um, but it was able to be brought under control it wasn't quite as infectious um, what that showed is that actually the disease could spread really quickly from one country to another and um, the lesson taken from this was that you should try airport screening but actually from this 
paper shows that seems to come up larger than I meant that actually that wasn't very helpful. That kind of airport screening didn't really work very well. What helps is identifying cases in healthcare systems and um, isolating them early rather than trying to identify people as they wandered through the airport. And the second one, MERS-CoV, another uh, coronavirus, um, caused a large outbreak in the Republic of uh, South Korea in healthcare settings with large amounts of person-to-person -person spread. And the lesson from that that we also should have taken is that these things can be explosively spread in closed settings like hospitals. So we had these of two warnings, both coronaviruses as well. Uh, and in fairness, you know, we did, I have been out and about, we did talk about these and say, you know, watch out for this kind of thing. Please record travel history. Please try and identify and isolate cases of coughs and colds um, from areas where there might be this kind of infection. Um, but not all the lessons were correctly learned. And yeah, so this is the point about SARS and, and travel. They invested a large amount in airport screening. It didn't really work. Um, I think we tried the same with, with COVID and I'm not entirely convinced of the efficacy of uh, limiting travel. Obviously, if everybody stopped travel completely, that would help. But there were so many exceptions that essentially it just slows it a bit and then it comes in anyway. So this pandemic that I'm talking about today started in China. And this was some of the early attempts I had to try and see how fast it was spreading. Started off as an unknown illness and was reported on the 31st of December, which is when we first heard about it with the first meetings early in uh, 2020. So it was difficult at the start, as you know. Um, first of all, we heard about cases and then a lockdown in, in Wuhan, and then we were counting the cases there from uh, Chinese reports. Uh, there was then spread to Europe, um, and uh, there was lockdowns in Italy. And all the time we were looking at these and thinking, well, that's not like us. That shouldn't, couldn't possibly happen here, um, despite the fact that... Uh, you know, people are roughly the same the world over when it comes to infections. Uh, and then we started seeing cases in England and then Wales, uh, and then started to get increased spread. We first started testing in uh, in, hos in um, travel cases, but actually we were probably missing a lot of cases. Uh, as this, this shows, we were looking at people coming back from Italy, but actually at the same time, People were coming back from Spain and France and all sorts of places. This is a genomic study. So maybe we limited our testing too much at the beginning. Um, to be fair, partly because there wasn't really availability of testing and there was all concern about um, exceeding the capacity. So then we came to the, and, and we're all, we've all familiar with uh, Neil Ferguson and, and John Edmonds and the, the analyses that have been done. Um, uh, informing the scientific advisory group for emergencies and this so-called SPY-M, the, the, the subgroup for pandemic influenza modelling group. Um, with the influenza name, you can see that, that we were thinking about influenza before and a lot of that informed um, the decisions. So what happened was we saw this going on elsewhere. We could see the cases rising um, in the UK. And we were worried that it was going to cause so many cases and so much illness that, that um, it would be too much for our NHS to cope with and also that it would cause a large amount of severe illness, harms, deaths in people. And so this kind of menu of measures was considered, all aimed at trying to um, reduce the reproductive number, those bits that I've, that I've, I've mentioned, things like case isolation to reduce the number of contacts um, household quarantine to reduce the contacts of the contacts, um, closing schools and universities again to reduce the numbers of contacts and the likelihood of, of infection. Um, and there were further ones in case isolation, home quarantine, social distance of over 70s. So each of those, if you put all them together, you've got the highest effect and, and, and uh, none of them was the, the lowest effect and you got a really, really big wave of, of infections. And we'd really never thought of this before you know this idea of all contacts all households was used contact outside the household school the workplace by 75 percent you know we'd never tried to do this before um and it was you know there was a lot of debate about whether it should be done as you can imagine and the modelers what they they 
put into the debate was, well, what will happen in theory if we do it and what will happen if we don't do it? So there's two effects here. One thing to note is that by doing little or not enough, we have so few intensive care beds in this country. This red line here, which is low red line at the, the top graph and the bottom graph, you can see that actually the red line is absolutely dwarfed by the projections of what, what could have happened um, had things just going to let rip. And so that, that was that limit to the NHS capacity. And as soon as you really exceed that, then people are coming to hospital, they're really sick, they get sicker, you can't do anything, and then potentially they just simply die, unfortunately. Um, so the idea was this, this, this idea to kind of flatten the peak and reduce the peak demand. Um, but there was also the second concern, and I think this contributed to some of the, the delays in the decision making, because there was a sense in which this was potentially just kicking kicking it, the can down the road that actually as because we haven't got an immune population and we didn't have a vaccine as soon as you remove the restrictions again remember these were unprecedented restrictions you just get another wave and you get another set of severe disease and it would overtop the nhs again and in this initial paper and this is one of the you know the, the first main paper that, that ferguson had about this they envisaged that you might have to keep locking down repeatedly for these waves. So you can see they're envisaging waves in, in July to September, November 20, Jan 21, etc. Now, in reality, we didn't get as many waves as that, even just without having locking down every few months. So it wasn't quite as, the frequency wasn't quite as much as that. Um, but that was the idea and that was the kind of debate at the time. So what actually happened? I'm just going to run through uh, what happened in Wales. And these charts are things that I produced myself from our case data and also looking at um, uh, what the Welsh Government has produced on, on when they um, increased measures. So this is the whole pandemic. And you can see, so I just move my bar, otherwise I can't see everything. Uh, so the grey bars are, the first one is, is when um, the alpha variant came along from Kent. So you can see there that caused uh, a big uplift in the second wave. In the, um, towards the third wave, you can see that that grey bar represents the delta coming along um, uh, with, Come from large cases from India, um, and then so that came at the end of the Delta wave, and then you can see actually I had to change the scales because the Omicron wave was caused so many infections uh, that uh, it's even gone off the scale here, and then you've got a second wave here, which uh, you can argue about whether it's BA two or, or relaxation of, of measures. I'm I'm more on the, the latter than the former hypothesis. But you can also see, fortunately, that as each wave has gone along, the first wave we had under testing, um, but good ascertainment of deaths, and there's a big wave sadly of deaths there, and an even bigger one in the uh, in the second wave. But by the third wave, on the same axis, the the, the absolute numbers of deaths are much smaller compared to the case numbers. So that's been a big effect of the vaccination um, program. So that's you know, why we're able to, although I'm lecturing online here, that's why I'm able to go out and go into the shops, etc., and, and don't, don't have to stay home anymore. Um, just in terms of wave one, as mentioned, there was less testing because we were testing many in hospitals. Um, here you can see the um, measures that were put in and the green one is the lockdown measure. Now, I think at the point that the lockdown nationally in March the 23rd was brought in, a lot of the cases were already kind of baked in to the whole system and so that was always going to carry on up until it started to have an effect and come back down again so really the green one is is what um that full lockdown is what brought that wave into control you can see that that took a while um and as i mentioned that's because there were already a lot of infections seeded around the country uh, and already transmitting and, and also that we you know we weren't counting if you look at the second wave, I've put in um, here local restrictions and national restrictions. This is within Wales. So the yellow ones are the local restrictions. So, you know, just Cardiff or Caerphilly or Myrtle or whatever. And my contention here 
and, and not everyone may agree with me, but I don't see those having an awful lot of effect on the curve. There's a sense in which it was a little bit slowed down after the first um, restrictions early on there, but, but then really it didn't really do enough to actually stop that upward curve. So um, my, my take home from this is really that unfortunately that for, for Wales at least only the national restrictions made a big difference, although we spent a lot of time trying to, to tailor restrictions to local areas and it does seem very unfair if the rates are very low say in Pembrokeshire and they're very high in Cardiff to, to, to have to not be able to go out in Pembrokeshire because the rates are high in Cardiff and I can totally see that uh, and there's the effects on the economy and on people but just purely in total numbers that sort of the effect um, and uh, the the second one is is that the the fire break that was introduced this was something that Wales did that that, that wasn't really done in 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 the rest of the UK so it wasn't done in England I think Scotland had a similar thing so we we, we recommended that they they brought in some more stringent measures um, towards the end of October to try and prevent a long wave and this was done and you can you see that green patch and you can see that that did bring infections down fairly quickly for the period and it brought deaths down as well unfortunately it wasn't possible you know to continue that for a longer period of time and just as I mentioned earlier you know you kick the can down the road you've got another wave straight afterwards uh, that's come that's come right up um, towards uh, end of December and there's a, I think there's a post Christmas bump there as well so that's what happened in wave two which was kind of the I think of it as the you know the mainly the the delta wave sorry this is the the alpha wave bigger bomb and, and wave three is what we're going through now so it started off with uh, with delta in in summer 2021 um, there's this very strange period when it was relatively flat and those are um, restrictions going upwards in Wales now I've said that the math is all very clever and it only goes exponentially up or exponentially down but here it didn't it kind of plateaued a bit and um, I'm really not quite sure why but there is a theory that people were so savvy to this now that they thought well okay if infection rates are high I will test I will moderate my behavior I will do lateral flows or whatever and I will not go out if I think I'm infectious or if I have no contact. So people were sort of self-moderating without, without, um, you know, without necessarily the full restrictions. Um, but beyond that, I can't tell you, I don't think anyone knows absolutely the answer to that. Um, of course, uh, what happened was in, in late December, then Omicron came along and caused this, this absolutely ginormous wave, um, which circumvented that balancing infection. And then we've had a couple of bumps since then. The numbers now are low because because this is based on the PCR testing and they're just not doing that anymore. So if you look at the lateral flows, they'd be pretty high as well. And if you look at all the controls, this is what it looks like. So the blue ones are national going up. The um, red ones are local increasing restrictions and the green ones are national reducing restrictions. So that's sort of what the pandemic looked like in terms of numbers of restrictions. So did it work? And this this kind of haunts me a bit because, you know, you want to do well and you want to try and protect your population. And, you know, it was difficult and I don't know to what extent we, we managed to achieve it. This is the cumulative deaths over the whole pandemic um, for different uh, parts of the world. You can see the EU, um, we're just below the EU average, below the UK average, we're above France and above Sweden below the US, but I, I don't think that's any massive cause for, for celebration. Um, taking some different countries, it depends which countries you choose, um, if you take out the EU average, the UK is at the top there, Wales slightly below, just above France, and then Sweden. But then if you look at the Netherlands, also a relatively small and well-connected country, and Norway, they really had overall very much lower levels of um, cumulative mortality. So despite all of those lockdowns and, and and remember that the deaths were i think the highest if you go back to the previous one the deaths were highest really in the wave two um so not due to the first decision making it was it, the, the highest deaths were in wave two so 
is it due to stringency? Well, looking at the stringency index, this is some data from the FT. Um, sometimes we all above these countries, sometimes for longer. Sometimes they had more stringency than us, as in the Netherlands. There's not a clear correlation. I'm not uh, minded to agree with that Stanford paper that says it was all a complete waste of time. But certainly there are other things at play here. Um, I also think that you know our, our NHS would have been overwhelmed had we not done something drastic um, at those times of lockdown. And the conjecture is that it's not just to do with how quickly you try to stop things and how long you lock down for, that it's to do with population vulnerability, inequalities and also connectedness and, and how people behave. And I mentioned that self-modification of infection risk. I think you know there's an extent to which uh, people can can adapt their behavior themselves as well so there's definitely inequalities in mortality so in the most deprived areas uh, mortality was, was roughly double that in the least deprived areas so you can imagine the countries with with higher inequality and, and i'm going to name check the united states as well would have done worse and countries with low inequality such as you know sweden and norway have done better on on, on this um, there's been some work on seeing which which of the interventions out of those lockdowns so lockdowns a whole bunch of stuff so you know which ones have the most contribution I'm not sure we'll ever really know perfectly but these are the ideas all gatherings banned takes you a certain percentage off your R all non-essential businesses closed takes you another percentage off your R education nighttime curfew mask wearing if you imagine R was kind of a big pile of stuff that you want to get down below a certain height to get under the barrier or something, each of these will shave a bit off it. But unfortunately, as each variant has come along, they made the pile higher. So it's much harder to get it under that bar of R, R is less than one. Um, certainly with in intestine traces, one of these things, certainly with Omicron, very difficult to do that. Um, for something like Ebola with a much lower reproductive number, actually good complete case finding, contact tracing is sufficient to control it. Um, but for something like Omicron, not so much. A couple of slides about care homes, because that was a large contribution to the mortality and a real tragedy there. A lot of stuff in the, in the, in the papers um, suggesting it was linked to the discharges from hospitals. Uh, and I always thought that, that seemed unlikely. Um, so we looked at this in, in Wales. Obviously, there was a rapid spread. This is from one outbreak and it shows you the spread across um, across Wales in terms of the locations and also the numbers of deaths. You can see those red bars showing large amounts of deaths um, in the in the first wave there. Um, and. Oh, this is the wrong one. So. We looked at uh, those discharges to care homes and hospitals to see if they increase the risk of outbreaks. And the thing is that there's a lot of discharges, over 3,000, but on average, that's only one per home per month or less than one per home per month. So it's not a common event. And what we found is that larger care homes had a higher risk of outbreaks, but the hospital discharges themselves, when you adjusted for that, didn't cause any increased risk of outbreaks. When we've done a separate analysis looking at staff, there's a twofold increase of outbreaks following staff cases. And um, modelling from uh, the Edmonds group suggests that the outbreak risk correlates with the community incidents, not the discharges from the hospital. And it, to me, it kind of makes sense. The hospital discharge is a rare event, whereas actually for a care home, every day, people, the staff, go in and out of the of the, of the place and, and go back home into the community where the infections are. So it's not always the obvious answer, but there's still a lot of, um, you know, speculation that it was the hospital discharges. And I think they can play a role. I'm not saying you can't cause an outbreak, but I don't think that's what it was. I'll leave that one and that one a big upon. So what's next? Um, we've got this Omicron. Um, thankfully, it is less severe than the previous Parents. Um, it also affects younger children, which the previous ones didn't really very much at all. So it's a new arena for, for infections, which is obviously bad for the children. But sometimes that's not so bad uh, because infections that are more severe when you're older, it's sometimes better to catch them when you're younger um, rather than 
avoiding them until you're older and then getting the more severe outcomes. You can think of chickenpox and things like that will we'll, we'll do that, but there's other infections. Polio is one of them. Um, vaccines, so we've got the current vaccines, which, was, which has, has been a, a fantastic achievement has reduced the severity of infection. Um, and also we've got a natural immunity. So I think for the future, it's going to be vaccines plus immunity. And from my job point of view, we need to try and make COVID more like other infections, reduce its burden, you know, put it in context, but also apply all the learning we've had from this to other infections. This is a picture of the mass vaccination center in, uh, in, in the Bay. Um, the vaccines that were um, produced against the original Wuhan Victoria strain is still working despite all of these variants. I mean, there's caveats to that, but they, they are. This is a picture of me involved in the, the AZ vaccine trial where we had a site in, in uh, Newport um, doing some of the first testing. And this was all the way back in sort of May 2020 when we had absolutely no idea whether these things would work or not. Um, but I was very pleased with the opportunity to, to contribute to it and also to be fair to get out of my bedroom office and uh, and you know get get involved in the wider team unfortunately these vaccines do not stop transmission so that was the expectation uh, because of measles but actually measles is unusual the mmr vaccine is an unusually good vaccine um and actually mo like many diseases we we're not preventing transmission with it they do prevent severe infection there is some waning of immunity even against severe infection and there was a risk from new variants that they might escape the vaccine and again cause disease but i i would and i'm not a virologist i have to be very careful here but if an infection if a vaccine isn't actually stopping the infection carrying on infecting people every year then um it doesn't have quite the same need to to escape immunity um, unlike some, you know, if it was if it was highly variable and the vaccination completely prevented transmission. But as I've mentioned, infection. This is probably the future. Infection plus vaccine. If you're vaccinated and you're infected, you've got quite good wide immunity. If you can't mount good immunity, then getting the vaccine will prevent severe disease and that's that's really the name of the game and it's a much better vaccine than say for flu where the effectiveness is is, is much lower against um, uh, infection and severe outcomes so we're not going to get to this which is what we got for measles going down from hundreds of thousands of cases a year to to no cases a year but we are going to reduce the the death and the severe outcomes i can't tell you exactly what's going to come next um, it's been an incredible couple of years and, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to reflect and, and put some of this down uh, in this talk. I think I'll stop there because it uh, that seems like a good point to pause. Thank you and I open up to questions or uh, yeah. Thank you, Chris. Uh, that was uh, absolutely fascinating and thank you for clarifying so many uh, issues uh, around the pandemic for us. Uh, I welcome uh, our attendees to uh, submit their questions via Q&A. Uh, perhaps if I could just start things off, um, Chris. Uh, in terms of where we're at at the moment, um, is your feeling that we've opened up at the appropriate time? Have we opened up too quickly? Are we rolling out the second booster fast enough for, for over 75s? Um, Will COVID infections become more severe for, for elderly uh, individuals? I have to be very careful because I, 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 I'm I don't, not supposed to comment on policy. So, and, and I know I'm okay. in the university, but um, I will say that there's, um, we, we, we're doing our own thing, you know, trying to, to have a separate and slightly more cautious policy in Wales, which as you can see with that fire break can, can work quite well. Yes. Um, on the other hand, if a very large country next to you says that it's unlocking on a certain date, nothing's going to stop those infections from coming over the border. So I'll just put that, put that there. Yeah. Um, we haven't seen really big increases in hospitalizations and deaths in this wave. Obviously, everyone is, is is bad, but then the lockdowns have have adverse effects as well. Yeah. Um, I've not seen anything too concerning in the epidemiology so far this year in terms of severe infections. Um, yeah, that's that's all I'd say really. I, on the vaccine rollout, I think that they're, they're 
doing their best and and it's it's a long game this it's going to be what do we do every year i think right right um, just trying to keep an eye um so uh do you think the next pandemic will be driven by another zoonotic uh, coronavirus is that if you had to hedge your you know your bets um well a lot of them do arise from zoonotic means um because you know that's why they're so different to, to what we're used to and why nobody's immune to them i do have a slight concern with this one that actually particularly omicron it's quite infectious in a number of animals including ones that we have daily contact with so it may have come imagine it came from bats there's not so many places where people are in contact with bats and, and there's not a huge amount of crossover but this is a virus that can infect dogs and cats and mink and deer and all sorts of things. So I do worry slightly about the possibility of it coming back out of one of those zoonotic sources. Um, but when we've tried to predict the next thing, you know, when I was when I was a registrar, it was going to be, you know, H5N1 influenza from birds in Southeast Asia. It yeah. turned out to be H1N1 influenza in pigs in Mexico. So, you know, predictions is a bit of a mugs game unfortunately yeah um we've got a question from one of our guests how realistic is the possibility of a combined flu and covid vaccine are they in development chris is that feasible i'm i'm, I'm not i apologize i've not kept up with the with the uh, flu vaccine developments recently although i do know that what 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 we're looking for is more less of a combined vaccine you can have a combined vaccine just by sticking them both in the same vial i mean that's the the first thing about and that's you know that was the advance of things like mmr is you just put them all in the same vial it sounds a bit simplistic but a lot of the challenge of vaccine campaigns is getting them into people and the more you can get in at once the more likely there's they've got them it, it's really very practical and logistic and what we really want for SARS-CoV-2 and for, for flu is a vaccine that that covers all the variants so that doesn't that doesn't get flown by a different spike protein or a different you know hemagglutinin combination for for flu so that's the kind of holy grail for both of those is something that will just work for all time uh, and, and hit something that's invariant yeah let's cross our fingers on that um, so, so, Chris, um, hindsight is a wonderful thing, but if you were to go back to February 2020, what would be the one thing that you would um, perhaps do differently or maybe not? Um, what, any thoughts on that? So I'm, I'm, gonna, I, I'm slightly... I don't think there's an awful lot we could have done differently. We could have, we could have, we could have locked down earlier. I think that we would yeah. use the, the impact in the first wave. I, I, there's going to be an inquiry. There's going to be all sorts of stuff. Let, let's, I'll leave that to judge. I'm going to be slightly unfair and say, actually, I'd want to go back before that. I would double oh. or triple the number of ICU beds and I would try and reduce the vulnerability of our population by through health inequalities, through housing. Right. Right, yeah. You know, I think it's. I think if you have a less vulnerable population, um, you can ride out things like this a lot better. And I think that's going to come out of some of the the analyses. Uh, I, 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 it was interesting that um, you mentioned the uh, the importance of uh, connectivity, and of course we have very close communities in in many parts of uh, South Wales, especially in, in the valley. So, do you think that was uh, was also a significant contributing factor then? Um, well, it's 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 not my work, and I'm I'm less familiar with it. But some of my, my colleagues, my colleague Daniel Thomas and colleagues in in Bangor University, have actually done a study on kind of um, connectedness and and uh, that sort of social aspect, looking at correlating that with the incidence. And in fact, some parts of that are good, but some of them actually do correlate with higher levels of uh, of infection. So I think there is there is a story there, and and yeah. I'll, I send you the link afterwards if I if I got it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, that was really interesting. Uh, and I guess um, one more more question I have is uh, how do we counter vaccine hesitancy, Chris? What uh, what can we do to uh, to to improve uptake of vaccines? So again, this um, this is not my main main area. There's others who are better experts in in the vaccination programs my feeling is and is that um 
sounds a bit stupid, but but you should ignore it. So I, I think what you do with someone who says that they, they're not keen on the vaccine is say, that's fine, here's the vaccine. And if they don't want it again, you say, OK, here's another opportunity to get the vaccine. And a lot of what people think of is hesitancy. I think the people who have got wild theories and strange views about this, they get a lot of the media attention, but actually a lot of problems with vaccine uptake are just because people don't have the time or the, yeah. the, the, the resources and it can mix in with a bit of a bit of views. But usually if you keep offering someone something and they and you show them repeatedly that it's going to be good, then yeah. they will eventually take it up. And actually we have very high vaccine uptake. And one of the success stories is is that our inequality in vaccine uptake is it, it is there, but it, it's really minimised because we try and keep you have to keep battling away at, at, at this. It's there's no exciting. There's no silver bullet. There's no exciting single intervention. You just keep going. It's an administrative and a logistic and a hearts and minds kind of thing. And, and, and eventually you get good uptakes and you yeah. save lives that way. Excellent. Well, um, if there are no more questions, Chris, I'd just like to thank you once again for an outstanding uh, presentation this evening. Uh, I really like that take home message of, uh, you know, how, how we can um, uh, think about trying to reduce disparities and vulnerabilities uh, to, to, to reduce uh, future impacts of, uh, of infectious disease. So that's a really strong message to take away from this evening, I think. Uh, and so, sure. thanks very much indeed. Hey. Uh, so that concludes our series for, the, for this year, but hopefully um, many of you will be back uh, in the autumn when we uh, commence our, our next uh, series. So stay safe, everyone. Thank you very much. We'll start. Thanks.